Today I am going to talk to you about Paul's understanding of salvation. One of the basic things that we, we need to remember as we discuss Paul's understanding of salvation is how Paul conceived humankind and the problem of sin. Although the term salvation in the whole of Bible is used with different meanings or different emphasis, for Paul, salvation is actually uh, being saved from the power of sin and the consequence of sin. So the term soteria he always uses in the sense of being redeemed from the sin or from corruption of this world. He uses various words related to this, like he calls God the Savior, in the sense of the one, the divine one who redeems someone out of the um, out of the clutches of sin. Similarly, he also uses the word to rescue um, as an equivalent to speak about salvation. Scholars have understood the idea of salvation in Paul in various ways. E.P. Sanders speaks about Paul's understanding of salvation as one's transfer from one sphere that is of sin, of law and of death to another sphere of existence that is of righteousness, of faith and of life. It is in tra being transferred from one sphere to another that is the basic characteristic according to E.P. Sanders of Paul's understanding of salvation. So when one is redeemed or rescued from the bondage of sin is now transferred into life of righteousness is the core point of Paul's understanding of salvation. But then if you Look into James Dunn's understanding of um, explanation of Paul's understanding of salvation. Dunn maintains that it is possible to study Paul's understanding of salvation by looking at the various metaphors that Paul uses. For example, Paul uses metaphors drawn from customs of his own time. Um, for example, like justification is something that was common in those days or redemption from the slave market. Um, so he borrows, Paul borrows those metaphors from there. Apart from this, Dunn also points out that Paul, when he tries to explain what is salvation, he draws metaphors even from daily life, like inheritance, speaking about, talking about inheritance, uh, waking up from probably from sleep, putting off of your clothes and putting on of new dress or he draws metaphors from the agricultural field he draws metaphors from the uh, from commerce for example he uses the metaphor of seal he uses the metaphor of first installment and he also uses other metaphors from the background of uh, from religious background and also from major events of one's life that is premature birth adoption marriage this kind of marriage with christ these kind of metaphors paul repeatedly used so for done it is also possible to look at all these metaphors in their own socio-political context and understand them better so then we will get an insight into how paul understood the idea of salvation it is also for him it is a break from one aeon that is from this age and entering into another age that is the age to come so in christ when one believes it is one's movement that happens from this age to the age to come now it is important for us to understand that for paul this redemption from sin or this rescue from the clutches of sin happens only out of divine initiative and it is that great offer in Christ Jesus that God provides to the sinful humanity. As we discussed earlier, mankind for 
humankind for Paul is in utter depravity and is incapable to find solution to the problem of sin by itself. So, in this utterly hopeless condition of humanity, it is God who comes into the stage and then he offers out of his grace salvation to humanity in and through Christ Jesus. So in a sense when we are talking about salvation, we are talking about the very purpose of Jesus' incarnation or why the second person of the Trinity took human form as Paul would quoting the, the ancient hymn. Uh, first century him he would say that he came in the likeness of man taking the form of a slave so this incarnation the entire exercise of Jesus taking human flesh getting enfleshed in this world in order to go up to the cross and offer his life as a ransom upon the cross for the sins of this world for Paul is all because it is ultimately leading towards accomplishing the divine provision of salvation in and through Christ Jesus, the Son of God. For Paul, Christ came into this world to save sinners. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. So, this God is a savior God. So, he will say, God our Savior and also you will find in other instances Paul also speaking about Christ as our Savior. Now in both the cases in Paul one should not make a lot of difference out of it. For Paul the offer of salvation comes from God himself who in the garden of Eden found human beings Adam and Eve rebelling against God out of their disobedience and thereby falling into the sin and corruption. Now this Savior God has actually planned it out from that time onwards to redeem this fallen humanity and restore them back into the relationship with Him. So He is the Savior God. The salvation originates from Him. However, for Paul it is very clear that this offer of salvation that comes from God the Father is actually materialized in human history only through the event of incarnation of Jesus. And so, so the, the God, the Savior, from whom salvation originates, is actually accomplished by His Son upon the cross in this world. He has offered His life as a sacrifice. And that is what in Romans chapter 3 verse 21 following he speaks about. When all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, here God offers his son as a propitiation or he offers his son as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of the sins of the humankind. There is no role of humanity or any human individual in attaining salvation. So it is attaining salvation. Now this salvation is also being rescued from the wrath that is to come. Paul speaks that since the humanity, the humankind has committed sin against God and it reels under the wrath of God. Now the offer of salvation that comes is actually being saved, being rescued or being delivered from that wrath of God that awaits for the sinful humanity with, on, the day of punish, on the day of judgment. God will punish out of his holy wrath everyone who will not return back accepting this offer of salvation. So in a sense, this offer of salvation is actually leading to a point where the sinful humanity that has moved away from God in relationship is now in and through the sacrificial death of Christ is now restored back into relationship. So now there is in Christ reconciliation taking place.
the mind of flesh that is sin and death and that is corruption and is incapable to produce anything good is now being restored in Christ Jesus and by that this enmity is removed and anyone who comes through Christ by accepting the offer of salvation that God gives is now brought back into the into a reconciling relationship with God. And this happens only in Christ. For Paul, salvation is not available outside of Christ Jesus. That is why he says, in Christ we are saved. We are saved in Christ Jesus. So the one who is saved, his existence is also in Christ Jesus. Christ becomes the spear where the redeemed humanity, the rescued humanity from the wrath of God is now brought and placed because this is where God's offer of salvation is available for every fallen human being who now wants to return back in communion with God. Without speaking about salvation for Paul, perhaps Christ has no important role in the human history. He is God. He is important for the humankind only because in and through him, God has decided to bring salvation upon the cross for the humankind. And this is purely God's grace. Like he speaks in Ephesians 2.8. This gospel that he preaches about the offer of salvation by God to the fallen humanity is purely the gospel of grace. Since humankind and no individual can do anything to be saved in this world, now God out of his grace offering his son as a sacrifice provides a way out from the greatest predicament of humanity that is to be enslaved by sin. It is God's choice that he offers but when he offers this salvation and those who respond to him in faith Paul says that it is they who are called by God to receive salvation this call is not a simple call but this call is to fix their eternity away from being condemned by God on the day of judgment and it is now for Paul that the offer of salvation is available to everyone. The question is who will be saved according to Paul's understanding. One thing is very clear in Paul's letters the offer of salvation is universal. It is to both Jews and to Gentiles, God has made the offer of salvation in a universal manner. It is not limited to any individual. However, in Paul, the, since the offer of salvation is not available out of Christ Jesus, for Paul, anyone who believes in him is justified by God. So one who does not believe is not saved, whether it is a Jew or a Gentile. For both, faith is the most important point by which one gets saved or one is brought into the new covenant community, the people of God. So in Romans 9 to 11, when he speaks about Jews, he still hopes that, you know, they would be saved in future. But that salvation is available to them only to those who will look up to the crucified Messiah on that day, on the last day. They will be saved. It is not that the whole, although the offer of salvation is universal, every individual God desires that he or she gets saved by accepting the offer of salvation, Paul realizes it very clearly 
that the one who is not ready to positively respond to the call of God to accept his offer of salvation in Christ Jesus will not be saved. So although the offer is universal, it does not mean that every individual will be saved. Paul knows it very well. God's desire is that everyone should be saved, but not all will be saved. Simply because not all are going to respond positively to the gospel that Paul is now preaching in the Roman Empire. Now it becomes important, is this offer of salvation completed once and for all? By reposing faith in Christ Jesus is one saved once and for all. And this is where that crucial or a much more debated point comes. What did Paul mean in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 when he says, when he exhorts them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling? This is how I understand. For Paul, there is no way that one, an in, a, a human being, that an individual could work out his or her own salvation. So that, that is beyond question for Paul. So then what did Paul mean when he says that work out your salvation with fear and trembling? What he means to say is that the offer of salvation that is given to you, when you repose faith in Christ and you are saved, you are brought into that reconciling relationship and you are brought into this church that is the new covenant community for, made of people brought together beyond every ethnic or racial or national or religious boundaries. They are brought together and formed as one community of God, the people of God. Now, to remain in this community of the saved ones, Within the grace that is available to everyone, one needs to live according to the teachings of Christ. And so it is very well understandable that although Paul preached the gospel of grace and salvation out of faith, being justified out of faith, he preached very clearly to everyone. He challenged Peter. In Galatians chapter 2 about his behavior and says that we being Jews are not able to fulfill the law how can these Gentiles do so Paul knows that an individual human being whether it is Jew or Gentile cannot work out salvation but once he is saved and the Holy Spirit is given to him within and poured out into him he is saved by faith in Christ Jesus it is human responsibility to respond appropriately to God's gracious offer in Christ Jesus. Does it mean that he is teaching that salvation is because of one's good works? No. The offer of salvation is purely by faith alone. But it does not absolve an individual of human responsibility to behave accordingly and respond in a responsible manner to that wonderful offer of eternal life that God gives in Christ Jesus. So the grace must be appropriately responded. Now it is very well known that for Paul, the role of the Holy Spirit continues in this salvation process where one is redeemed and sanctified and then regenerated. So the Holy Spirit's work continues in the salvation process. But in this process, one needs to be very cautious, must work out his salvation in, with fear and trembling so that he or she does not take God's grace for granted. When did this salvation happen? Now Paul's letters, if you read, it becomes very clear that Paul appears to speak about this salvation in all the three tenses. He speaks 
that in the past you were saved. That is at the point of time when you reposed your faith in the crucified Messiah, you are saved from that movement onwards. And you continue in that saving life even now, in the present. You are still saved. You were saved when you reposed your faith. You continue in that faith even now in the present. But this is still incomplete. The consummation of salvation will happen in the, on that day of judgment when finally God will declare you justified. So what happens in the past is when one when a sinner reposes faith in Christ and then accepts the offer of salvation at a particular point of time in the past, he or she is saved in view of the final declaration that God is going to make about this person finally on the day of judgment. So it is sure that the one who has believed in Christ and desires to live in the newness of life, rise up with Christ into the newness of life as in baptism he testifies by his action or her action and then to continue to live in that in the present and waits for that final day on the day of judgment when God will finally justify him and give him or her the place in his eternal kingdom. Salvation begins in the past, it continues in the present and it is still looking forward to the future when it will be culminated. Now in this context only we should remember the remnant idea that he speaks about um, in Romans chapter 9 to 11. Israel has not believed in Christ now. Many of them have rejected. Some have believed. They continue as the saved people of God even now. And they will be saved in the day to come. On that final day of judgment. And even at that moment when the Messiah shall return. Those who will turn and look unto him. And will believe that Jesus Christ is their savior. Will still be saved. And God will finally justify everyone who lives in Christ in the present. God will justify them in future. There is the point when God will judge and his wrath will be displayed. When the man of lawlessness will be cast down. The power of sin will be completely destroyed. And God will restore the final kingdom. It is at that point that one would experience the salvation offer of God through Christ in its completeness. So are we saved in the present? Yes, we are saved. When we believed in Christ, we are saved. And we are responsible now to live in that saving knowledge of God. To live that sanctified life. To live constantly that regenerated life. The as in baptism, the old is thrown away, buried, and the new you wear, new self you wear, and come up out of the water. In the same way, that experience must be lived out every day. The self must die. The flesh must be crucified. And the life of Christ must be displayed through us. For this particular reason, Paul is regularly emphasizing on the ethical living of the believers. Things that are found outside of the body of Christ must not find space within the body of Christ, that is in the church. Why? Because it is the community of the saved ones. They ought to display a certain pattern of life modeled after Christ Jesus himself. So, in Philippians and in Corinthians, Paul exhorts, imitate me. As I imitate Christ or just as the imitation of Christ I do, so also you join with me in imitating Christ. In different ways that those verses could be understood. Whether you follow me or you join with me in imitation, the prime model 
for a Christian, a saved Christian, to live in the saving experience or saved life is to follow that image that model that is visible in Christ Jesus. Hence, it has a larger consequence. The salvation of humankind has consequence beyond human, um, human experience. Because when man committed sin or human beings committed sin in the Garden of Eden, God cursed the entire create, uh, created order. The entire creation was cursed and now the land or the ground produces thorns. And with lot of hard work alone, by sweat alone, that man can harvest the fruits that it produces. So, when man committed sin, the creation was cursed and condemned. In the same way, when humankind would be restored back into the divine relationship by the right response that humankind gives towards God. Although not will do, it is only a remnant. Some who will believe in Christ, but still in their salvation, God is going to restore the entire creation. That is why in Romans chapter 8, he speaks about the groaning of the entire creation. That it may be redeemed from the corruption. That is that has entered into it due to human sin. Paul says that this creation is actually eagerly waiting for that day of salvation. It has that eschatological tone. Paul's soteriology is also closely connected to that eschatological framework of Paul's theology. For him, Christ, in Christ, God has intervened in the past at one point of time in the human history to make sure that the offer of salvation is given once and for all in Christ Jesus upon the cross. And when someone believes in him, he receives that salvation, lives in this age, as a saved person, still experiences the tension of sin working in him, but the desire to get closer to Christ and the demand to live according to the age, the standards of the age to come while one is in this age and still long for that final point of time when God will finally justify the humanity and destroy the powers of sin. It is then that the salvation will be finally accomplished. So salvation, are we saved? Yes, we are already saved. But is the salvation culminated? Is it complete? No, it is still in the process and it will be consummated on that day when on the, judge, on the day of judgment, God will declare every child of God as justified. It is on that day that the process of salvation will see its completion. But now we are saved because in Christ we believe that what is going to happen in future is already made known to us. So when the Spirit, as Paul speaks in Galatians 3, when the Holy Spirit is poured out into us, it is a guarantee that God has already saved us. It is the first installment of that permanent offer that is kept for us in future. I hope with this we get an overview of what Paul's soteriology is all about and how he understood that the greatest problem of humankind is resolved by God in Christ Jesus.